ശാരീരിക വൈകല്യങ്ങൾ അത് ജന്മന ഉണ്ടാവുന്നതാണെങ്കിലും ഇഞ്ചുറി ആക്സിഡൻറ്റ് മുതലായ അത്യാഹിതങ്ങളാൽ സംഭവിക്കുന്നതാണെങ്കിലും അതെല്ലാം പരിഹരിച്ച് ആ വ്യക്തിയെ സാധാരണ ജീവിത രീതിയിലേക്ക് കൊണ്ടുവരുന്ന ശസ്ത്രക്രിയയുടെ അത്യാധുനിക വിഭാഗമാണ് പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് ആൻഡ് റീകൺസ്ട്രക്റ്റീവ് സർജറി വ്യക്തികളുടെ രൂപവും അവയവങ്ങളുടെ പ്രവർത്തനവും മെച്ചപ്പെടുത്തി ലൈഫ് ക്വാളിറ്റി തന്നെ ഉയർത്തുന്ന രീതിയിലുള്ള ഈ വിഭാഗത്തിൽ പ്രാഗൽപൻ തെളിയിച്ച കിസൈസ് ആസ്ട്ര ഹോസ്പിറ്റലിലെ പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് സർജറി സ്പെഷ്യലിസ്റ്റായ ഡോക്ടർ രാജ്കുമാറാണ് ഇന്ന് നമ്മോടൊപ്പം ഗോഡ്സ് ഓൺ ഹാൻസിൽ വെൽക്കം ഡോക്ടർ സോ വിൽ ബി സ്റ്റാർട്ടിംഗ് ഫ്രം യുവർ ബിഗിനിങ് സോ ഹൗ യു came to the medical field so there is there any reason or any person as an inspiration yeah so when i was growing up in my town so on the time like we had a doctor who was doing a lot of service in my area okay so he was the one who was treating my mother so after some time uh, unfortunately my mother she was diagnosed to have a, a cancer in the intestine so on that at uh, that time uh, he was the one who was taking care of her and uh, unfortunately we couldn't save her but uh, that started as an inspiration for me that uh, why can't i do and uh, try to make an impact in other people's life so it started like that then uh, i used to study well so i i i started writing some exams then i got into the med- medical, medical field. field so in medical field uh, how you came to this uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery yes so medical field uh, initially we have to do a mbbs after that we have to do a ms general surgery mm-hmm. so after doing ms general surgery only we can pursue for mch in plastic surgery so when i was doing uh, ms general surgery uh, there was a pl- plastic surgeon in our hospital who was very talented he used to do he used to do wide range uh, variety of surgeries and he used to inspire almost like all of us so a lot of people who uh, went to the um, Uh, ms general surgery we used to have a uh, rotation postings so when we used to uh, visit plastic surgery i think people who have who wanted to do other branches also because of this person they uh, they got influence and they wanted to do plastic surgery and uh, i'm one of them who wanted to do this one actually initially i wanted to do oncology okay because of uh, my mother's condition and yeah. this thing i wanted to do oncology it is cancer surgery but i got inspired then i thought like why can't i do plastic surgery then i did plastic surgery so it's like a it's a wide uh, subject plastic yes. surgery so what all uh, um, branches comes in that uh, so, so simply that yeah. people can understand so it's uh, not usually people will say plastic surgeon plastic yeah. surgery yeah. but the full degree is uh, plastic reconstructive and oromaxil uh, oromaxo mm-hmm. facial surgery so in this there are lot of branches so one thing is initially starting from the child there is a congenital branch and then we have the reconstructive surgery per se but usually most commonly known is a cosmetic surgery so we do cosmetic surgery only also but it's a it's a part of plastic surgery it's not the only thing which the plastic surgeon does in the reconstructive surgery we used to reconstruct some parts or some damaged uh, tissues probably because of any reason probably because of cancer or probably because of trauma or some uh, blood vessel disease if it is removed we will reconstruct that one so in congenital we have the cleft lip cleft palate all this facial uh, congenital malformations all these things we deal with congenital surgeries and then we have microvascular surgery separately where uh, i think the name itself says that it's a yeah. microvascular we use microscope and then we repair the uh, blood vessels, blood vessels. and then we have a specialized hand surgery also which is also a branch of plastic surgery then finally burns is there we do burns care also so when we coming to this uh, surgery uh, can you uh, give us an example or experience regarding emergency uh, surgical cases so there are so many experiences almost like every patient is different we used to get uh, almost uh, every day is different to us so whenever the mo- there are but there are some significant and uh, milestone surgeries in my career which i have done so if some patients or anyone if they are injured the first thing that we see is whether there is blood supply so obviously without blood supply that area is not going to survive so that area is going to necrosis and probably you might need it to we have to cut it off so whenever they come to emergency this one we always check for the blood supply if it is Mm, damaged 
then it becomes an absolute emergency the patient has to be shifted there but uh, by god's grace i think god has given some grace time for us so even without the blood supply that part can survive for some time our job is to go within that time and re establish the blood supply so that uh, the part starts surviving so once that survives then we can go again and we can reconstruct the other part uh, other other functions of the parts which is damaged hmm. so all these things comes later okay. so immediately the vascular injury immediately we go inside so uh, naturally that healing process will be done there with that yeah. uh, restoration of the blood circulation yeah okay uh, any cases uh, with that uh, any injury history of injury uh, okay so sometime before we got a patient who has who is a chef by occupation so mm -hmm. he he has to do this uh, noodle cutting okay so there is a big noodle cutting machine so which has some blades inside so when we was feeding this one it chopped off his uh, both his fingers so uh, luckily the patient had so much knowledge uh, he 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 properly preserved that uh, finger in a ice box and uh, there is a method so you should not directly put it on the ice so you have to wrap wash it wrap it in a plastic cover and then you have to keep it over the ice if you keep it directly over the ice what will happen is that part will get frozen then obviously it will it will just it doesn't work okay. so he has brought it he has stored it properly and he brought it to us so once he came immediately we saw so whenever it is cut we have to see both sides okay. whether both sides are intact so if they are uh, if the damage is not much and if they are intact then we can re yeah. rejoin this one so this was the procedure which took around like 14 hours so each finger you can see the fingers the blood vessel everything will be very very small so you have to do it under microscope and then we re rejoin and the uh, patient had a good function so obviously it comes under a micro surgery right yeah. okay so uh, is the um, you have told about that congenital cases so any experiences uh, regarding in congenital yeah regarding the congenital actually we had one patient um, she had a con congenital condition where the skull bone usually when we are born our head is very small hmm. so but when we grow the brain also grows which initially it grows uh, by 3 years the growth will be rapid so this time what will happen is the skull usually uh, the skull will be having lot of fusion points hmm. or junction places so when the brain grows the skull will start giving gaps hmm. and it will be later uh, replaced by bones hmm. but this condition this congenital condition specifically what happens is that this fusion occurs very early so the brain cannot grow beyond a point because the skull is stopping it to grow okay so if you leave it like this what will happen is the pressure inside the brain will keep on raising mm -hmm. and uh, the baby will have a very bad milestones meaning that she cannot attain the normal milestones the, okay. there is some time where we speak where we start working where we sit so all these things are there no all these things doesn't happen because the brain doesn't have room to grow okay. so in that case we opened up and then we uh, we we in simple terms we just separated these bones the the baby needed so much separation that uh, we cannot leave it like that so in between we took some ribs there are some extra ribs which you can take mm -hmm. and then we bridge this gap so that baby is still fine great Uh, so uh, technological development you told about many new technologies has come uh, to this uh, field of plastic surgery so any uh, what is the new technological development so regarding plastic surgery the micro surgery itself is a very recent uh, very uh, technologically advanced uh, version only before we uh, when things were uh, in the initial stages when things were damaged uh now we are able to repair things which you cannot see using microscope okay. so before this one it was not possible so that is itself is a big advancement so the second thing is that uh, tissue engineering so now i told you know so when one part is damaged we are borrowing tissue from the other part to reconstruct the function of this part but uh, tissue engineering it's a very new concept uh, still in nascent stages so in this you need not borrow from other places whatever you want it here you can make it in the lab and then you can just fix it just like a spare parts okay so that is really that will be a great intervention in this uh, field yeah. 
so Dr. Ben, uh, when we uh, talk about this, I have read an article regarding you, uh, a case regarding rhinoplasty. Yeah. So, can you just explain what happened in that case? So, he is a patient. What happened was, he was trying to clean house and he was standing on a ladder. And there were, when he was cleaning houses, there were this knife or some sharp objects here. Okay. So, he slipped and he fell down. So, when he fell down, he initially noticed some bleeding. He compressed and then he went to the hospital. So, in the hospital there, they diagnosed he has lost his nose. Okay. So, the knife has cut his nose and there is no nose. So, this is a unique case because if you see the nose, there are, its, it's anatomy is very complex. So, you need this uh, triangle shape and you need two holes to breathe and in between there should be a, a support. So, without this the nose will just collapse. So, there should be a skin outside and there should be skin inside. So, all these things to, should happen. So, what we did was the ideal, there are two, three options, but the ideal option is to take a forehead skin, uh, which is the ideal uh, donor for this one. Because if you take skin from the arm or something, the color will be different and second the texture will be different. If you touch the these two, they are ideally, they are matching. So what we did was we took the skin from the forehead, we rotated it and then we contoured it like a nose so that it had uh, both layers, one outside and one inside and then we reattached this one and after four months we just uh, returned whatever was extra back to the forehead. While discussing about this uh, rhinoplasty, uh, I. Uh, I need to mention about Shushruta. Uh, he is a father of surgery and uh, in Samhitas it is told uh, rhinoplasty was done in that ancient time. Yes, yeah. So Shushruta is um, father of Indian plastic surgery. So the surgery which I mentioned before, the rhinoplasty, mm -hmm. it, it was done like, two, it's really uh, fascinating. This was done like 2500, 3000 years before. Obviously, we are doing the modern version of that. Mm -hmm. Now we know that how it's function and how to take that one, which is supplying the bed. But uh, Sushruta has done this like 2000, 3000 years before. So how, how I can tell you a story regarding how this started uh, as a, this one, how they found out that Sushruta is a father uh, of the Indian plastic surgery. So there was this uh, soldier who was working for uh, British government in uh, Mysore area in the Karnataka and uh, in that time if T Tipu Sultan if he finds that you are working for British government he will take you and he will cut your nose. So uh, there was an Indian uh, uh, soldier so Tipu Sultan he cut his nose. So now the British people they didn't know how to reconstruct the nose. So when they asked this guy uh, this soldier he said like we have one uh, pot maker in our village you take me to him and uh, he will make my nose right. So they took him to the pot maker and they saw that the pot maker made a, with the clay he made a model nose and then he, he took the impression from the forehead and then he rotated something uh, very similar to what we are doing today. And uh, the British then they published in the uh, their journal, mm -hmm. in the British journal. Then they when they found out the roots of this one they already knew, the, uh, they, all, they found out that Indians already knew this procedure and they are doing this for 3000 years. So that's the story behind this surgery. Okay. Okay. Uh, while discussing this plastic surgery, doctor, we cannot exclude cosmetic surgery from this. It's, a, it's really a vast area which is developing nowadays. So any experiences regarding this cosmetic surgery you can share? The patient which I remember usually, there are two patients, one is that uh, one patient, she is around like 40, 47 years female. What was done was, she previously she has undergone so many abdominal surgeries. So the abdomen became so loose, it started hanging down till the mid thigh, she was, it was hanging down and she was in lot of depression and uh, multiple surgeries were done before. So she came to us uh, with lot of wounds here because that area was rubbing against each other and she can't walk. She, they, she was advised to lose weight but she cannot walk then how can she lose weight. So she came to us and we were able to put back all the uh, intestinal contents back again inside. We were able to correct all the hernias and we were able to do that without placing any mesh or something with the stitch only and then we removed all the extra skin and then we uh, she is okay now, she is happy now, she, she has lost a lot of weight post surgery, now she was, she is able to go to the gym or she is able to run and uh, she, she is taking care of her own. Okay, 
So while talking about this cosmetic surgery, uh, many of the celebrities and all the people around the world, they are doing it in a cosmetic purpose also. So is this affordable or is this uh, economically possible for a common person? So initially, as you said, some 15, 20 years before the cosmetic surgery, it was very, very costly. You can see, you, you people imagine that only the actors, actresses and celebrities, they can afford for this one. And it was not available in uh, their place. They used to fly to USA. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, it has become very common. And as it became very common, the prices also have come down. So it has come down to a very normal level. Nowadays, we get school students, college students, and very young people who are in their early careers, they are able to afford it. So it, the prices have come down a lot. Okay, doctor. Uh, one more thing I want to ask you about the burns. Yeah. So, you know, uh, many of the people uh, who suffer from uh, bone, they will be having scars and also so many functional difficulties they face. So, uh, do you have any experience regarding these burns? Yes, burns is a major part of plastic surgery. So, it's a, I could say like it's a sad part of plastic surgery because when someone gets burnt, then it, after a, uh, if, if a major portion of the body is burnt, then their life changes completely after that. And it's permanent, most of the things. Mm. So, we, one patient whom I, I can remember is that uh, usually when burns happens and if it, uh, if it is more than 20% of your body surface area, then usually it's fatal. I mean like it, it endangers your life. But this patient, he was very strong. He's a young man and uh, he came to us like 85% uh, burns. So he had so much burns, almost like entire body is with burn. Only 15% of the surface area was fat. So we, he was there in the ICU for like two, three months, then in the ward for six months. Almost he spent like one year with us and uh, we were able to save this patient, not only save this patient, after everything started healing, we did a lot of uh, cosmetic surgery for him. Mm -hmm. So we, for the burn uh, to remove the scars and also to release the contracture so that his hand can function. So he used to have burns till at this place. Okay. So below this was completely burned, but above this was packed. So what we did was we inserted some tissue expanders where the normal skin was stretched to replace the burn scars. So this tissue expander is placed under the skin and this tissue expander is expanded. Like two, three months it expands the normal skin. So once the normal skin is expanded, we can remove the burn scar and we can Replace bring the uh, normal skin. Down. Doctor, while discussing about these critical cases, uh, do you think uh, we doctors are hands of God or tools of God? I think we are just tools. I don't think some people say like gods are uh, doctors are gods. I don't accept that. We are just tools in the hands of the God. Uh, while uh, entering into an operation theatre, the patient and also the bystanders will be they will be having so much questions in their mind and they will be all uh, thinking about what will happen, what will be the consequences. So what will be the mindset of a doctor? So usually patients, they will have a lot of doubts and they will have a lot of doubts like five minutes before the surgery. So I always keep it as a practice in my clinical practice. I will always call the patient and the uh, bystander of the patient. I will talk to them for like minimum half an hour. And I will that I, I feel like that helps a lot during the surgery also. The patient is relaxed and uh, the doctor patient confidence is re-established and uh, you will also be comfortable so that you can tell the patient what is expected from this surgery and uh, how the patient is going to do after the surgery. So all these things are very important because Surgery is a very normal thing for me. We are doing uh, daily. Yeah. But for a patient, it might be a once in a lifetime experience. So we should always talk to the patient and uh, we should explain to them what they are going to go through. So this is, this is the thing which I do. But if you ask the mindset of the doctor, then I'll be very relaxed in the operation theater. Okay. So there, there is no uh, chance for any uh, panicking in the operation theater or there should not be any surprises. So whatever you have, uh, the best time is to do it before the surgery. So if you're having any, any doubts regarding the diagnosis or what are the parts that are injured, 
you do it before the surgery so that you don't end up in surprises once you open up so most of the time i think like it's not possible 100% of the times obviously there will be surprises but we should be able to handle it before this one so i'll be focused on this one rather than thinking about the actual uh, disease which is there so doctor you, uh, during your academic and professional career you might have faced so many challenges so can you uh, tell us what were challenges you have gone through yeah so uh, when when i was like before my medical career i used to think like okay when you like, get a doctor degree everything is fun and after that you are all settled but it's not the case entering into a medical college itself is like a cutthroat competition you have to study like uh, day and night mm -hmm. and uh, once you study it's not like life is all green from there you have to put in a lot of effort you need to study books which are written in greek and latin obviously the most of the names are in greek and latin you need to study all those things and uh, you are expected to work like 48 hours shift continuous you will you will be expected uh, to be in your utmost uh, efficiency all the time even though you are tired and there will be a lot of cases where you will be hungry where you need to attend nature's call but you cannot do that because there will be patients and it will be busy so all these things uh, i think it's part of the job i wouldn't say that it's uh, uh, difficult or this one but you have to be ready before you take a medical field we have to make our mind before uh, going yes. into medical field apart from all these emergency cases and all uh, while coming to a planned surgery uh, what are the contraindications in which we cannot uh, go for a plastic surgery yeah uh, when you see for contraindication in as the surgery also advanced the anesthesia techniques also advanced so ideally if it, if you speak there is no absolute contraindication for surgery but there are lot of areas where you don't want to venture into or do a surgery in a patient where the disadvantages of doing a surgery is more than the advantages mm -hmm. so imagine suppose if he is having a big heart condition or a lung condition or liver is not working then in that case you would like to go without the surgery only we we'll think like because the dangers are more than the advantages or the benefit obviously you have to weigh both sides and you have to see that which side is better but uh, apart from this if you see like uh, cosmetic surgery per se the patient might have over expectation which is normal so but when you talk to the patient usually the patient will come to an understanding that these are the things that can be done for her mm -hmm. and these are the things which can be expected for the condition or the structure which she is having but some patient inherently there might be a scar in the childhood or something even if you have created the best nose still they will think like uh, their nose is not a uh, normal the we call it as bodily dysmorphic disorder mm -hmm. so these patient you have to identify this ones you can identify only when you talk to the patient for some time and you will be able to figure it out that whether the patient is normal or she is having this kind of issues in that case i think it's uh, we cannot perform the surgery because even if you have made the best surgery possible still the patient will have problems uh, we have uh told about all this these all experiences are uh, really achievements in your life and what all the achievements and awards you have uh, got in your career so after my ms i did my mch in plastic surgery in sadarjang hospital which is uh, i think like largest hospital for plastic surgery in uh, south asia mm -hmm. so after finishing that i went to brazil for my cosmetic surgery training so after that i presented a lot of papers in uh, international conferences and uh, i think we have designed one uh, uh, surgery which is kind of new uh, totally new so where uh, we we do a flap initially uh, but it had a lot of complications like venous conditions and all these mm -hmm. things we have devised a way so that it can be performed easily also even by a junior plastic surgeon okay. but we have uh, we have designed in such a way that it avoids all this uh, complication which was there in the initial form mm -hmm. so i think like that's an achievement which uh, we have uh, reached so uh, as an experienced plastic surgeon what are the advices you can give to the junior doctors so as a experienced plastic surgeon the advice which i want to give junior plastic surgeon is uh, you keep investing in yourself and keep investing the time and also 
obviously the advanced training it takes some amount of money so whatever money you earn initially you don't try to spend it on uh, other things try to invest it on the workshops try to invest it on the uh, skills to grow your skills there are a lot of workshops and training programs so initial uh, period where you can learn you should use the money for this one rather than spending it outside so it takes a lot of time for you to become a seasoned plastic surgeon so but uh, this once you finish the mcs the remaining 2 to 3 years will be your golden period so in this time you should uh, start investing on yourself ഒരു വ്യക്തിയുടെ ജീവിതത്തിലും സാമൂഹിക തലത്തിലും ഒരു പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് സർജനുള്ള സ്വാധീനം എത്രത്തോളം ഉണ്ടെന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ രാജ്കുമാറിൻ്റെ എക്സ്പീരിയൻസസിലൂടെ നമ്മൾ കണ്ടു കഴിഞ്ഞു ഒരുപാട് ഇതുപോലത്തെ സർജറികൾ ചെയ്ത് സക്സസ്ഫുൾ ആവാൻ ഡോക്ടറിന് കഴിയട്ടെ എന്ന് ഈശ്വരനോട് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഇന്നത്തെ ഗോഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഹാൻഡ്സിൻ്റെ എപ്പിസോഡ് ഇവിടെ പൂർണ്ണമാകുന്നു അടുത്ത ആഴ്ച വീണ്ടും കാണാം ബൈ